Hello everyone, I hope you are all doing well. So uh, this is just our usual announcements video. So the first thing I should note, remember because it's Memorial Day weekend, um, there's only three days of class. So that means that this will have less videos this week. It won't take as much time to complete the assignments because it's meant, you know, this is meant to mimic like an in-person class. So there's a day off for people who have in-person classes, so we have a bit less too. And I hope you all have a, a have or had a good Memorial Day. In addition, since it's uh, Memorial Day weekend, I'm delaying the password due date. So instead of being due at Tuesday 11.59 p.m., it's due at Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. Because, you know, if you're out traveling, you may not get this email till like Monday night or something. Or even Tuesday. So real quick, I want to go over the study guide for week three. So we ended talking a little bit about Korea last time and how Japan had annexed Korea. So we're going to continue that, looking at the economy, what that was like in colonial Korea. We'll then also look at the status of Korean women in the, clo in the colonial period. And again, we are going to be in this part or just the nature of this class, because we're dealing with China, Japan, and Korea, we bounce around a bit. So we're going to move then from Korea to China and look at the May 4th movement in China. And then uh, the May 4th movement involves, uh, it's basically a student movement. It should be, I hope, interesting, since you are students, of course. It's talking about how students can, as students, impact history. And it talks about how they're trying to come up with new radical ideas to deal with the problems China faces. And this leads some Chinese people to become interested in communism. And it's kind of an interesting story about how communism becomes the, uh, basically in the, the ruling party of China today. And that's a story our class is going to tell. And in a sense, this is where it's going to start. So we'll talk a little bit about communism in China. We'll also need to talk a little bit about, though, what communism is, or at least the theoretical ideas behind communism. Uh, China today isn't that communist, even though it's ruled by a communist party. We will then also look at how the opponents of the communists, the nationalists, the people who were actually in charge of China in the late 1920s and 30s, how they were trying to develop China and make it into a strong state. And we'll also look over the str struggle over Manchuria. Now, you may remember we talked about Manchuria earlier. That's where the Manchu came from, the people who made who established the Qing dynasty. And there's a good chance that you've never heard of Manchuria but uh, before taking this class. It's the northeast part of China today. But what I think is fascinating is that a lot of what led to World War II is going to happen um, in Manchuria. A lot of the events that eventually give rise to World War II occur in Manchuria. And we're going to start seeing some of those issues here. And basically, it's a struggle over Manchuria that leads to war between Japan and China. And it's the American policy... Uh, towards China and Japan because of that war that eventually leads Japan to attack us at Pearl Harbor. So that's why this, what's going on here is really important. We then will look at what this war between Japan and China was like for Koreans. They're part of the Japanese Empire. We'll also look at this video called Identity in the Japanese Empire. And this is one that was, I think, very difficult for me to make because it's kind of out of my area that I specialize in. I'm mostly interested in things like politics and economics and uh, religion and so forth. And this is looking a lot at ideas of gender and sexuality. So areas that um, I'm not as good at, if that makes sense. But I enjoyed making it and researching it because it's areas I don't know a lot about. So do bear with me as you look at this. I hope it does make sense. But basically the idea is that in the while we think of Japan as a homogenous nation, right? Who lives in Japan? Well, most people are Japanese. The Japanese empire was not homogenous. There were lots of different types of people, right? There were Koreans, Taiwanese, um, Manchurians. And we'll even talk about how Mongols, or I'm sorry, not Mongols. We'll talk about how Manchus will also be in interaction with, with the Japanese Empire. And we'll look at how these kind of ethnic and gender identities all kind of mix together and make for some very interesting history within this heterogeneous, not homogenous, empire. So, and for the last video, um, is less, it lasts about an hour and a half, but it's this documentary called Japan's War in Color. 
and it's on YouTube, but, but there's a link as usual. And it's just really, really well done. It has some great narration. They, they do a good job of, of bringing in historical sources. Uh, they, they have lots of quotes from Japanese people living in this time period, and other people as well. But I like assigning this documentary for this class because it's looking at a Japanese perspective primarily. Um, it's so you're probably used to hearing about World War II from an American perspective, which makes sense uh, if you're an American, right? But here it really does try and tell from the Japanese perspective. Now, one thing I want to note because this is a long, like I said, this documentary I think is about, remember, it's about 90 minutes or so, so it's fairly long. And so what I did was they'll often like they'll they'll when they switch scenes at the bottom of the screen, it may say Yokohama or it may say Peking or something like that. And so what I did was when I had a question, I usually tried to give you like a timestamp and I would try and give you a clue. So, you know, you, you should be able to answer these two questions in the first six and a half minutes. Between the six minute, 30 second mark and between the 11 minute mark, you should be able to answer this question, right? Uh, between 11 and 14, you should be able to answer this question. And usually I try to give the people's names that, you know, here, what did Tori Yoshida tell her daughter not to do? Why? But in other places... Let me find an example. Yeah, how did the Japanese soldier view the battle of Peleliu? It's not quite clear what the Japanese soldier's name is. They say it really quickly. And I said, well, they've got the timestamp, you know, between 45, 7, and 50. That's close enough, right? That's close enough. So that should help you be able to keep track of this. And it tells the story of how they got to World War II and how World War II ended and even the beginnings of the occupation of Japan. So I think it's a really well done documentary, which is why I wanted to assign it. And one thing that I think is nice uh, as we continue in this course, the further along we get, the less it's me talking, right? With, of course, with older materials, we don't have as much uh, information. Uh, you know, there's no videos from the 19th century, right? There's no one alive from the 19th century who we could interview today. But these documentaries like this, allow us to kind of immerse ourselves in this history. And I, I think that's very valuable. So I hope you will find those uh, interesting. The writing assignment is fairly simple. It's two readings from Shigeru Mizuki. So in week two, you read about what his life was like as a kid. Now you can see what his life was like as a soldier. And it's kind of interesting because uh, Shigeru Mizuki was not a particularly good soldier. He was good at surviving. Uh, but as, And he presents himself, I think, quite honestly. He wasn't a particularly good soldier. But it basically is just asking you to ask some questions about those two um, readings. And then just says, how would you describe life in the Japanese army? Now, the last thing I need to talk about, and I know this may seem kind of odd because we're, we're just moving into week three. But remember, this is a class that ends in the sixth week. And you only have like two days of class in week six. So I need to say a little bit about the final. So the final exam, of course, is in week six. And it's cumulative, but I tell you what the cumulative part is, right? So if you go to the, let's go back just to make it clear. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm not on the right. Here we go. Got to make sure I'm on the right screen. So if you go into the content, right, you can see the different weeks. If you go to week six, right, you're going to see, you know, the stuff from there. Um, this is stuff that's hidden from you as a student. I can see it. You'll see two documents. One, it says final exam names and terms, and this says final exam names and terms in alphabetical order. So these are the names and terms that you would need to know for the final exam. And I want to mention it now because you're being exposed to some of these people, and you may want to take extra note of them, right, and to keep reviewing them, make sure you've got your notes in order. Now, if you open the final exam names and terms document, you'll get to see something like this. So names and terms are organized alphabetically by the week in which they first appeared. So week one, these were the names and terms you were exposed to there. Week two, here are the names and terms that were, you were exposed to here that could be on the exam. And it just goes on so forth. Oops, had Sigmund read there twice. And so that just gives you a sense, okay, these are the people who could be on the exam. There's week five. So, you know, obviously we, you know, when you're watching this video, you've only done weeks one and two, but I wanted to go ahead and, and mention this so you know, okay, I finished week one, but I need to still review who these people are, right? I want to make sure I remember who all these different people are. And before I forget, let's make Amaterasu our password, right? Amaterasu, the Japanese sun goddess who the emperor is said to be descended from, that'll be our password. I'm not too strict on spelling, just, you know, just make it clear uh, in your email that 
this is what you're trying to say, Amaterasu, the Japanese sun goddess. That will be our password. So I would encourage you to go ahead and just download this to keep an eye on this. Make sure you know and remind yourself who these people are. Uh, so the final exam will be asking you to be able to identify who these people are and some important things about them. Don't worry, the final will not be too bad. Um, especially if you're able to prepare this way. Now the other document that I have up there it says final exams, names and terms in alphabetical order. I also gave you the exact same list, but it's in alphabetical order. Now, why would I give you the exact same list in alphabetical order? Well, the answer is simple. Um, when you take the final exam, it's open note. And it would be much easier to find a name in your notes if your notes are in alphabetical order. So I would encourage you, you know, to copy and paste in your notes or, or type them into this. And then on the exam, you know, on the final exam, if it says, you know, there's a question, you know, who is Cho Man, Sh Man Shik? You know, you can easily look up CHO and then find his name. So that's just something to hopefully help you prepare and do as well as possible on the final exam. So that is all I have to say for now. I hope that you're finding the course interesting and rewarding. I think as we get further along, this course actually gets a bit easier. There's more documentaries and things like that. And also the stuff is just, I think it, it's more alive. It's more, it's more clearly relevant to our lives today. In any case, have a happy Memorial Day. Uh, good luck with everything. And as always, let me know if you have any questions.